whether you are aware of it or not, you've entered into a season of war. <clears throat> this is war. In the realm of the spirit, war has been declared. So we surrender as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts, yes. or you're going to go AWOL. Choice is ours. But the war of the heavenlies has gone to a new level and is intensifying. And it is over the, the individual, it's over the family, it's over the community, it's over the city, the town, the state, the, the nations. But you have entered into a battle of war. This has opened up and we have entered in. Stay in Christ. You stay in Christ, you're fine. In Christ. In Christ. And you listen. You know the thing that amazed me about Noah is that he's in this ark for such a long time. And I'm and in the one of the studies that I was looking at this morning, because I'm going through Genesis, it said that the waters covered the earth three miles high. Like over Mount Everest, over everything, three miles high. So I'm sitting on my bed and I'm looking out my window and I'm looking up at units that are a little bit higher than where I'm from and I'm looking at the trees that are higher than the units and in my head I'm going, I cannot conceive of that amount of water that would even cover the next door neighbour's units. But it covered them. And then it covered the trees, three miles and so he's in the ark and he's floating on everything with death and destruction outside, life on the inside. <clears throat> and then the water subside, sends out the raven, sends out the dove. Dove comes back, checks out its feet. Is it still muddy? Can I see? No, but the, the dove goes out again, does not return until it lands on Jesus in Matthew. But Noah stayed in the ark until God told him he could come out. Like even then the dove had come back with the olive leaf and he knew it was fine to leave the ark, it was fine to step out. He did not make a move until the Lord said, now you can come out. And how many, I'm thinking I would have been desperate to get out onto some dry ground and to see some greenery and shrubs and, and maybe see something happening. I would have been desperate to get out of that ark. But he stayed where he was until he had the word of the Lord. And this is that season. You stay where you are until you hear the word of the Lord. And you step out with him. You step out for him and you step out in him. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes. <sighs> when do you want to worship? Uh, I'm on a flow, so you do you want to worship? Stay, stay, stay where you are. <sighs> One of the things, and I'm not speaking against the church, the bride of Christ, I'm speaking against that, but one of the things that has happened with church culture is that we have become weak. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to upset anybody. We'll stand our foot. We're so nice. <laughs> but when you're a kingdom person, you stand for the kingdom. And every place the sole of your foot treads, you take it for the kingdom. You take it for the kingdom. There are only two kingdoms on this earth. King Charles, nothing. <laughs> right? There's only two kingdoms, kingdom of God, kingdom of darkness. If you give way before what if you give way to anything, you're giving way to the kingdom of darkness. But we're called the take ground. Take it. So whatever area in your life where you are suffering, where it's oppressive, where you've not got the finances, you haven't got the health, your family isn't what it should be, take the damn thing back. Come on. Take it back. And How dare you let 
the enemy take from you what belongs to you. How dare you? Jesus paid such a price, such a price. He gave his life. His back was shredded. His head was submerged under the crowns. He went to hell and fought for us. He rose from the dead and we accept a life that is this big. And we allow sickness and disease and we allow rant, riot things in the family. We allow stuff to happen. We give ground. We give ground. We yield it up. Anytime we decide not to stand up, anytime we decide, oh, no, Lord, I'm not going to get up and pray. I'm just going to stay in bed for another hour. You have given ground to the enemy. You have said, no, what you know what, God, you might be God, but right now flesh is God. So I'm staying in bed. And we're entering into a season with the mercy of God and the grace of God is so going to be so active in our lives. But we have to be obedient. Because Jesus said, the only way I know you love me is by the measure of your obedience. And how dare the enemy take from you? How dare you let it happen? You have got to get a righteous anger on the inside of you that everything that you have is sacred and belongs to God. He has no right. And I don't care what's in your generation. I don't care what's in your lineage. I don't care what generational ties are there. I don't care because Jesus dealt with every single thing at the cross. Sin, iniquity, transgression, he dealt with the lot. And so we stand before God and say, I claim the blood. I claim the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And there might be something in my generational line that has allowed this to happen, but I stand before you, God, and I say right now, I claim the finished work of the cross. I claim what Jesus Christ has done for me. I claim it. I claim the voice of the blood of Jesus that speaks on my behalf. And you have got to get militant. Lovingly militant, but militant. The spirit of love and unity is absolutely essential, but there has to be a sense of militancy. How dare a defeated enemy that is defeated for eternity who was paraded around in Colossians 2.15, paraded around in front of any, everybody as a defeated enemy, and the note that was held against you is nailed to that cross, how dare he come against you? How dare he? But we have things, we say things like, oh, well, it's a fallen world. These things happen. But we are supposed to bring heaven to earth. Heaven and earth coming together. That's why it's Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Messiah. It's the hypostatic union. He is 100% human being, son of man. He is 100% son of God. Heaven and earth coming together in, in harmony. Jesus Christ, heaven and earth, son of God, son of man, coming together in harmony as he is, so are we. So you are to release heaven in your life, heaven in your circumstances. And sometimes it's a fight. Sometimes you have to literally take a stand. If you want to turn to Matthew, and let me just, uh, I don't know where I am, I don't know what I'm doing. But I've had a week of, of just feeling sorry for myself. So um, Matthew eleven twelve. Matthew eleven twelve. Now listen. Sundays are going to be kingdom for weeks because we have not got kingdom culture in this house yet. We've not got kingdom honour operating to the extent that it should be. We've got bits and pieces, but we haven't got kingdom culture flourishing here yet. Wednesday nights are going to be the ecclesia because you cannot live in the kingdom without understanding ecclesia, whatever it is, ecclesia, ecclesia whatever it is, depends on the country you're in. But you cannot live in the kingdom without an understanding of what being the ecclesia is. And you cannot be in the ecclesia without understanding the kingdom. 
they flow together. So Sundays will be this, Wednesdays will be the Ecclesia. And for those of you who can't make Wednesdays, I can send you the link. It's going to be videoed, Zoomed or whatever. We can send you the link so you can catch up. But the two come together like a marriage. They flow together like a marriage. And when you understand what Jesus Christ has redeemed you to and from, that he has paid the enemy's ransom for you in every area of your life. You are the redeemed of the Lord. Yes. You have been redeemed from the hand of the enemy. He can have no hold. No hold. There might be some stuff we've got to walk through, but he, has, he can have no hold. Is this making sense? So when you get the understanding of this, it's a whole different walk. And when you understand that Jesus Christ has given you his authority, his authority, the authority that he walks in belongs to you. Seriously, what can the enemy do? You have the same authority as Yeshua, as Jesus, the same authority. And when you live kingdom, and when you recognize that you are an ambassador for Christ, there are certain spiritual diplomatic immunities that you have in the spiritual realm. Ambassadors have immunity. So do spiritual ambassadors. There is a diplomatic immunity that you carry in the realm of the spirit which actually allows you to go further in the spirit and do more than what, than what somebody who does not recognize who they are as an ambassador. As an ambassador, the whole of the government of heaven backs you. As an ambassador, you speak what the king tells you to speak. As an ambassador, you're not just a believer. You're not just a saint. Okay. Okay. You're not just a priest. You're not just made up of your gifts and anointings and talents. You are a body, wholly filled and flooded with God himself. Ephesians 3.19, you are a body, wholly filled and flooded with God himself. That's in the realm of the spirit. So if I stay in the realm of the spirit, I am a body, wholly filled and flooded with God himself. I flow with that. There is nothing that can come against God. But if I step into the soul, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. Oh, I think that's a little bit beyond my capabilities. Oh, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out. I have stepped outside of the that the covenant outside of the understanding, I've stepped outside of this amazing place where I'm filled and flooded with God himself. You are filled and flooded with God himself, every one of you. If you are filled and flooded with his presence, there is no room for anything else. Oh, Jesus. Woo! That's why you've got to learn to live in the spirit, the soul. Is nowhere near, it's powerful, but it's nowhere near as powerful as the spirit. You are filled, you are flooded with God himself. It's the power of the kingdom. This is your power. This is your authority. This is your dominion. Yes. You were given this power, this authority, and this dominion from the time you were born again. The minute you said, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, the minute you said that, he was given your power, your authority, and your dominion. You were given his. Now, you might not function at the fullness of it. You might be like a six-month-old or a six-year-old or a 16-year-old, but you were given it. How much you use, how much you move in it, how much you release is entirely up to us. It's an individual choice. But God has given you everything. He withholds nothing from those who walk in him. So this is, and this came out in the prophetic roundtable this morning, this is like a call to order. Because when our lives do not reflect Jesus Christ, we are in disorder. Mm -hmm. 
and the whole issue is about the kingdom. When Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus came through in Matthew 2.2, 2, it was about the wise men came and they said, where is Jesus, king of the Jews? King, recognised from the beginning. When he started his ministry in Matthew 4.17, the kingdom of God is here. In fact, he told his disciples, everywhere you go, pronounce the kingdom of God is here. Do we do that? I don't. Time to change. Time to change because we are uprooting everything that is not of the kingdom in our lives. We've got to come back to a pure foundation. Jesus demonstrated the kingdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20 says that we should demonstrate the kingdom and he did it in authority and power. The authority is in Jesus Christ. The power is from the Holy Spirit. The authority is Jesus. He is the name above all names. The power comes from the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, 18, because of his death, because of his burial, because of his resurrection, he conquered death and he secured all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. That means the devil has no authority. The government thinks it might have authority. Your boss might think he has authority. The bank mortgage might think it has authority. But Jesus Christ has all authority. Yes. All authority. And then he says, now you go and you use that authority. You use it. You use it. That's part of the, the kingdom mandate that was given in Genesis 1.28. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, when Jesus had risen from the dead and then he was with the disciples and he spoke with them for 40 days before he ascended, for 40 days he spoke about one subject, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, one subject. You'd think they might have got bored, but he always had something to say about the kingdom. We don't talk about the kingdom. We don't discuss the kingdom, not like we should. We don't really know what it is. We don't really know the currency, the constitution. We don't understand any of these things really. We might have a bit of an idea, but what does that look like in my life? How does that work? How do I, how do I spend the currency in the kingdom? How do I understand what the constitution is? How do I understand the governmental hierarchy in the kingdom? All of these things, what, how does it affect me as an individual? These are things as a kingdom citizen you've got to learn. Honour is massive in the kingdom. Love and truth, massive in the kingdom. But we don't really honour. We might not agree with the government, but we have to honour their position. Might not agree with your pastor, me, or anybody else, but you have to honour their position. Honour is massive in the kingdom. And there's so many things that we do not understand. We are ignorant of its laws. The law of fragments. The law of blessing, how the blessing changes the government over things, that things can only multiply after they've been blessed. If you want the spirit of multiplication in your life, start releasing the blessing. So there's many, so many things that we do not understand about the kingdoms or we, or we don't really apply it. So one of the things that we have to step into is the reality of the kingdom. That When you live that lifestyle, people will come to you and say, I want what you've got. How many people come to us and say, I want what you've got? They might say, oh, I love the atmosphere in your home. I love that. But how many people actually say, I want your lifestyle? But when you demonstrate kingdom, people will come to you because of your lifestyle. So we have to leave the confines, the constraints, the limitations, the mindsets, the wrong foundations, the roots of churchiology, Tradition, family, because most families are not in the foundation of a godly family. The way that your work is meant to be your worship, because work and worship is the same Hebrew word. When God gave Adam work in the garden, that was to be his worship. We don't often go to our work and treat it like worship. God, I'm doing this for you because I love you. Kingdom is so different to what we, what we need to understand. So we need to welcome the kingdom into our lives. You actually need to have a funeral at home and a little shoebox and just write on it anything that opposes the kingdom, then bury it in your backyard. 
have a funeral. And then welcome the kingdom. Holy Spirit, I want the fullness of the kingdom in my life. I welcome the kingdom. I declare the kingdom of God is here. I recognize the kingdom. I'm going to usher the kingdom into my life. Usher the kingdom of God into situations and circumstances. Usher the kingdom of God into my place at work. I'm going to usher it in. I'm going to prioritize the kingdom. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then all other things are going to be added to me. So as I prioritize the kingdom... There will be no lack and there will be no need. And I'm going to be transformed by the kingdom. Because in Matthew chapter 5, time and time again, Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, but now I say to you. But now I say, that's kingdom. In the old, you can't, you can't commit adultery. But in the new, you can't look at a male or a female to lust. It's a whole different level, a whole different board game. The kingdom is a game changer. And it can only be completed by the power of grace and the Holy Spirit in your life. So there's a whole, got to be transformed by the kingdom. You spend time in Matthew chapter 5 looking at, you've heard it said, but now I'm telling you. And you will find time and time again there is so much to change. We actually have to embrace kingdom. Whether we understand it or not, say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I embrace your kingdom lifestyle. Why don't you say it right now? Father, with with the name of Jesus, I embrace your kingdom lifestyle right now. Give me understanding and revelation. Teach me kingdom. Cause me to live it. I embrace it with all I am. In Jesus' name. Because when you embrace kingdom, you're embracing heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Romans 14, 17. We can no longer, and that was something that Robert Bobby brought out on last Tuesday at KI. Christian people who own a business own the business but if you're a kingdom citizen Jesus owns the business everything is about the kingdom everything is about the kingdom Romans 14 17 says the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink but instead it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So anytime you're missing peace, anytime you're missing joy, anytime you feel condemned and not righteous, understand right then that the kingdom of heaven has been covered over by something else and you need to flick off that unrighteousness and that condemnation. You need to flick off whatever it is that disturbs your peace. You need to shake off the thing, the oppression that stops you from being joyful because it's righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You need to have those things activated in your life. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are as righteous as Jesus. Not 99%, not 90%. You are 100% as righteous as Jesus in God's eyes. Jesus said, I leave you my peace. Peace is not only tranquility, wholeness, um, restoration, safety, soundness and rescue and all of those other things, tranquility. Peace is also the authority to destroy the chaos that comes against you. That's what shalom is. It's two sides of the coin. One, it's wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken. The other side of it is that it has the authority to destroy the assignment of chaos that is coming against you. So when the Jews say shalom, shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, but the chaos that's coming against you is destroyed by the power of shalom. You know, as you walk through the doorways in your home, bless going in and bless going out. 
kitchen to dining room. If you did that a few times every day, you'd see a noticeable difference in your life. I'm blessed going into the bedroom. I'm blessed coming out of the bedroom. I'm blessed entering the kitchen. I'm blessed leaving the kitchen. I'm blessed walking through the front door. I'm blessed entering back into the front door. I'm blessed walking through the, the office door at work. I'm blessed walking into the bank store. I'm blessed. Everywhere you go, you are blessed. You are blessed. Blessed. And it's the blessing of the Lord that makes you rich and he adds no sorrow with it. You're blessed. The blessing destroys the curse. The blessing breaks up the fallow ground. The blessing brings in the, the rains of the spirit where things are dry and barren and brings forth fruit. The blessing, you should wear it like a mantle. Wear the blessing. This has got to be your reality. I don't want to hear about the block. I don't want to hear about what you watch on TV. I really don't want to know. And I know that when I get really fed up, I binge TV, but that's got to stop. Because I, that's really not going to give me life. What gives me life is when we come together and we talk about Jesus. When you say, this is what God's doing, this is the revelation I've got about God, what, what's God showing you? Let's pray about it. This is what we need. We come together and we talk just like the world. We talk about China. We talk about Russia and the Ukraine. We, and that's fair and reasonable. We've got a right to do that. But what I'm saying is when believers come together, there should be a communion. There should be prayer. There should be praise. There should be, you know, a coming together. One. What, what draws us? It's Jesus. Jesus is what draws us. He's our common ground. He's our common denominator. And then we've got the beautiful Holy Spirit that just fills all the atmosphere around us and, and, and just, just does amazing things. I have over 21,000 prayers to the Holy Spirit. Scriptures that talk about him. Every time I see something, I write it down in my Holy Spirit book. I'm up to my fifth volume, handwritten prayers to the Holy Spirit. I want the reality. I want to know him. Man, I want to know him. If Jesus said, it's better for you, Suzette, that I go back to heaven to be with the Father, and, and so I'm sending the Holy Spirit, it's better for you that I go away so you can have the Holy Spirit, I want to know the Holy Spirit. Oh, where's the passion? Where is the passion? Where is the zeal? Where's the hunger to see a move of God? We've got 44% of the people on the Gold Coast who don't believe in anything. They are ripe for salvation. But not salvation to sit in a church. Salvation to fulfill their destiny in Christ. And Jesus is not going to return until it's the gospel of the kingdom that's preached to all nations. The gospel of salvation has been preached. There's still some people groups that have not yet heard the gospel. But most of the nations have heard the gospel of salvation. If you look at Australia, it's the gospel of salvation. Not a lot of fruit from the gospel of the kingdom. That's why we're so weak. That's why, you know, our other... What do we call them? Other entities have taken ground in education, in government. Even banks are now saying, well, if you don't support this or that, we're going to close your account. Like, come on, guys. Come on. You are a kingdom citizen. Now, I love Australia. You know, we've been on the we've been here since eighteen something or other, not nowhere near as long as Lloyd's people. But my people have been here as well. And this is a united society transmitting righteousness and love in action. Australia, they're the initials. That was a prophecy that was spoken over this land over 40 years ago. A-U-S-T-R-A-L-I-A. -A, -A, a united society transmitting righteousness and love in action. That's kingdom. We've got to start moving into kingdom. We might not understand it. We might not 
But the minute we take a step and say, Father, we've embraced your kingdom, now teach us kingdom. Teach us how to live this. Make it a reality in our lives. Let me be able to bring life to the people around me. In Matthew 11, I was going there, Matthew 11, 12, where it says that the, let me just get there, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent and the violent take it by force. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven endures violence and violence take it by force. Do you know what that means? One of the things it means, because that's a difficult verse to translate. The kingdom of God is within me. You carry the kingdom of God everywhere you go. Is not right? The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God suffers violence, endures a violent assault, violent, try to seize it by force. But the kingdom of, of God within you is attacked by the kingdom of darkness. They are trying to stop the kingdom of God from moving forward. And we have to possess like violent men take it by force, we have to forcefully hold our ground. They're trying to take it, but we've got to forcefully hold our ground. It takes on a whole different perspective when you start to realise the kingdom of heaven is on the inside of you. The devil doesn't really care if you're a Christian because you're not much of a threat. You go to church on Sundays, you go to the prayer meetings, you know, but you're not aggressively, assertively living kingdom. And this is the whole thing. So in order to be a kingdom citizen, the foundation has got to be right. And the problem with our foundations is that sometimes our foundation is not based upon Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. It might be based upon the fact that we're Pentecostal. It might be based upon the fact that I'm a churchgoer. It might be based upon the fact that I'm this or that. It might not, be, but it's not necessarily based upon the fact that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and everything has to line up with that. We say that um, democracy is the foundation, the cornerstone of this nation. Well, Jesus Christ is to be the cornerstone of our foundation. So what happens with a foundation, sometimes I've got a garage, the foundation is laid, but there's cracks in the concrete. Weeds grow up through the cracks. So our foundation for kingdom living has got to be relayed, resurfaced and reframed by the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. Because if our foundations are faulty, you cannot build. Or you can build, but it'll fall, house on sand. The foundations have got to be right. So everything comes back to Jesus Christ. He is the chief corner stone. Everything gets laid against Jesus. He is grace, he is truth, he is wisdom, he's our sanctification, he's our redemption, he's our righteousness, he is our life, he is everything. But every Jesus Christ must be the foundation. And then with that is the apostle and the prophet. Those three things must lay the foundation. So as I said earlier at the, the prophetic roundtable at home, as an apostle, I just want to get the job done. Right? I just want it done. I know that this house is behind time. I know that we're not flowing with the timing of God, that there will be, as we come into alignment and agreement with what he wants, there will be a supernatural acceleration. But I'm just interested in getting the job done, seeing people set free, moving on, fulfilling the assignment, next assignment, Lord, that one's done, next assignment, Lord, that one's done, next assignment. But the prophets... And that's why we complement each other. The fivefold complement each other. We don't compete, we complement. The apostle comes in and says, well, do we want tables or chairs for, for, the, for the meeting? And, uh, we know, and I'm thinking, just get the chairs out, or whatever, it doesn't matter. But the, the prophets are going, well, we, know we want so many chairs, we want it this way or that way, or we want it this way or that way. And that's what the apostles do because they see stuff in the heavenly realm that the apostle doesn't. And so as the, as the prophets feed the apostle, this is what we're seeing is happening in the spiritual realm, then the apostle can then bring that thing and land it on the earth. 
bring heaven to earth. So we need the, the prophets to move with the, the, the apostles. So the foundation is always Jesus Christ. It's always Jesus. And then the apostles and the, the prophets working together to bring about the realisation of the perfect plan, purpose and will of God in that person's life. But unless you know Jesus Christ, unless you know the truth, you cannot stand. Your foundation will be faulty. What is the truth? Why does the Bible say that abortion is wrong? Why do we oppose this? Why do we oppose that? Why do we embrace this? What We need to understand the apologetics of the Bible. We need to understand why you believe these things. Can you back it up? Not just what Scripture says, because when you're talking to someone in the world, they, they don't even care what Scripture says, right? We can say, thus saith the Lord, and unless it's like Peter and coated with the Holy Spirit to pierce their hearts, they're going, don't care. Don't care what the Bible says. Don't believe in it. It's a different, it's a different time from when, you know, when I was growing up, when, when some of your younger ones were growing up, people went to church, they went to Sunday school. Not anymore. So you can know people that have never been inside a church except for a funeral or a wedding. And to sit down and say, well, but the Bible says, and they're thinking, so? So what? So we've got to understand and be able to talk in a way that is not Christian, but be able to release the truth, coded by the Holy Spirit in a way that people in the world can receive. The foundation has got to be Jesus Christ, the living word of God. The apostles and the prophets working together. And then, you know, the Lord brings about the evangelist and the pastor and we all come together. But in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says that his government will never come to an end. So by faith I believe. For unto us a child is born, Jesus. To us a son is given, the Messiah. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. So we have to believe that even when we're not seeing anything change in, the, in, the, in our nation, anything change in our lives, that it's changing in the spiritual realm, that of his government there shall be no end. It's always increasing. So whether we see it or not, the government of God is always increasing. And we are called as kingdom citizens to bring his government to earth. That's what the ecclesia is all about, releasing the government of God upon the earth, releasing it. This is what God's government is, so we're not going to allow that to happen. We're releasing the government of God. You've got to be able to understand this. So Isaiah 9, 6, of his government, there shall be no end. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. So we are part of an ever-increasing, ever-progressing, ever-moving forward government and kingdom. And as it moves forward, you are, you are called to move forward as well. You are called to take ground, take possession, move forward, take dominion, walk in authority. The reason is, Matthew 6.10, you are called, commissioned to bring heaven to earth. God's kingdom come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, we, and that's, that's what God wants. That's his vision, bring heaven to earth. His strategy is Matthew 28, 18 to 20, I've given you all the authority. Now you go out and you disciple the nations. You teach them everything I've taught you. You baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants. So you've got of his government and his in, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. The kingdom is an ever-increasing, ever-growing kingdom. God's vision for us is to bring heaven to earth. The strategy is Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Disciple the nations. Now, it might mean discipling the family next door. It might mean discipling a group of kids after school. It doesn't matter what it looks like to you, but find your assignment and fulfill it. And if you don't know your assignment, ask him. He will show you. It's something that you will be passionate about. It's something that you're excited about, but it's something that gets you angry when it's not working right. Fulfill your assignment. So the cornerstone has to be 
Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to have a look at some scriptures and it starts in Psalm 118. You'll be glad when I'm quiet. Keep going. Psalm 118 verse 22. If you could just get the urgency in the realm of the spirit to step into what God is doing, there's such an urgency. And sometimes, you know, we're just not aware. We can pick things up, but it's the sense of urgency. And it's not a pushing, pulling thing. It is a Holy Spirit, come on. I'm leading you, but there's an urgency. There's a window of opportunity. You've got to take hold of this window of opportunity because there is a window of opportunity for some of the things that God wants done. But he's always the God of another opportunity if we miss it. But I don't want to miss it. I don't want to have a second opportunity. I want the first one. So Psalm 118, verse 22 says, I'm going to find it, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus was the one that was rejected. It is the chief cornerstone. Turn to Isaiah 28, 16. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion, and Zion is the name for the church. Right, I'm laying in the church for a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of sure foundation. And he who believes will not be ashamed, will not give way and will not run away in sudden panic. If you believe, you will not run away. Zechariah 10.4, Zechariah is the book before Malachi. Zechariah 10.4 says, and out of Judah shall come forth the cornerstone, out of him the tent peg, out of him the battle bow. Every ruler shall proceed from him, and they will be like mighty men, treading down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle, and they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on the horse shall be confounded and put to shame. And he says, I'll strengthen the house of Judah. I'll save the house of Joseph. God is going to do a mighty thing, but unless we get on board with him, unless we align with him, unless we um, come into alignment with what he wants, wants to do we're not going to see the fullness of this outworked in our lives Acts chapter 4 verse 11 Jesus is the stone which was despised and rejected by you the builders but which has become the head of the corner Jesus is the cornerstone so everything in life must line up with Yeshua. That's why Paul said, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, let Christ be fully formed in you, that you would be conformed to the image of Christ. Turn to Ephesians 2.20. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone, and in him the whole structure is joined and uh, into a holy temple in the Lord. In him. You have got to stay in the spirit in Christ. And the last one's 1 Peter 2.6. And this mirrors what we saw in uh, Zechariah. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. For thus it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen, precious, chief cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall never be disappointed and never be put to shame. And let me say that sometimes we have been disappointed and we have been put to shame and sometimes I think it's because our faith has been in our prayer life. Our faith has been in how much we've studied the word, how much we've prayed. Our faith has been in us rather than in the finished work of the cross in Jesus Christ. Our faith has been in me. This is what I've done. This is how I've stood. This is what I've thought. God isn't interested in that. But secondarily, he is, but the first thing is Jesus Christ. It's about what he has done for us. It's about what he did at the cross. It's about his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection and his ascension. It is about Yeshua. It is about the Messiah. And if 
if we don't align with him, we open ourselves up because we wrestle not with flesh and blood but with principalities and powers. And so you are wrestling in the flesh instead of wrestling in the spirit. It is so important that Jesus Christ, the living word of God, is our foundation, that we stand in and on the truth, that he is your sure foundation. Yes. And there are many times I've said, God, I don't understand. I really am not getting this, what's happening in my life, but I will say, I believe in Jesus yes. because that is the work that God has called me to do, believe in Jesus. So the foundation must always be Jesus Christ. Must always be. When you stand in him, with him as your cornerstone, you will be strong, you will be sure, you will be immovable, and you will be unshakable. Unshakable. Immovable. You're in him. And he never gave ground to anything except the will of God. So I understand, because I get it completely, that I want to live in the spirit, want to flow in the spirit, desire to live in the spirit, but there are times when my flesh rises up. There are times when my soul gets in the way and I try to work things through in, this, in the soul realm, think about this analytically, look at this from logically, point of well, logically, what are the pros and cons, and I do all that kind of stuff. So I don't always get it right. Don't always get it right. Oh, you just got to talk to me to know that. You know me long enough to know that. But the thing with God is that he is the God of another opportunity. So we look at the, the disciple Peter. And in John chapter 18, over a, a coal of fire, and I heard this preached, I would say, over 30 years ago by Cole Stringer, and I have never, ever forgotten it. John chapter 18, verse 18, it made such an impact on my life. It changed me forever when he preached this. John chapter 18, verse 18. And this is where Jesus had been arrested and Peter was standing near him. And in verse 18 it says, The servants and the guards had made a fire of coals that has a particular aroma. It smells different to a log fire or anything else. It smells different. And it was cold. They were standing and warming themselves and Peter was with them standing and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus said, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in a synagogue and in temple where the Jews congregate. I've spoken nothing secretly. And then they go on and they accuse him. And it says in verse 25, but Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. And they said to him, aren't you also one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I'm not. One of the high priest servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off, said, didn't I see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it and a rooster crowed. And then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium and it was early and they themselves did not enter the praetorium that they might not be defiled. But Peter actually denied Jesus three times. And I have a book called Mr. Jones Meet the Master by a guy called Peter Marshall. It was written like forever ago and in that he said can you imagine because Peter is in the same area as, as, as Yeshua as Jesus in the same area just a bit of a difference between them cold fire he's over being and he said when the rooster crowed and he knew he had fulfilled the, the prophecy that Jesus had spoken you'll deny me three times he said can you imagine what he felt when he looked at Jesus or if Jesus just would have looked up and looked at him. Can you imagine? You've just denied the man that you've walked with and believed in for three years. And you've denied him. And in Matthew, when it takes you through that, with each denial, there was a greater intensity 
until he ended up cursing when he denied Jesus. First he says, no, I don't, and then he gets really loud and angry, and then he curses. So there's this whole thing. But once you start to deny the Jesus, it kind of grows. It kind of grows. Until the point that our heart gets hardened. And we don't even realise what we're doing. We don't realise how much TV we're watching or how much comfort food we're eating or whatever it might be, or how many glasses of wine we're having at meals, whatever. We don't realise because our heart has been changed by our denial of the lordship of our master. But Jesus, ever compassionate and always loving, gave Peter an opportunity to get restoration. And in chapter, in John 21, verse 9, they see Jesus on the shore and Peter dives in and swims. And then in verse 9, when they got out on land, they saw a fire of coals. So the same aroma would have been hitting his nostrils. Every time Peter cast past a fire of coals, he would have remembered how he denied Yeshua. It would have been a pain in his soul. And sometimes, you know, when you do that often enough, you think there's no way back. There's just no way back. I'm lukewarm. I've been spewed out of his mouth. No way back. But Jesus, he said, bring some of the fish which you've just caught. So they hauled the net. And so over this coal of fire, Jesus and Peter goes for a walk. He's got the smell reminding him of what he's done. And Yeshua asks Peter three times, do you love me? And for, so for every denial, there is a redemption. So it doesn't matter how much we feel we've denied. It doesn't matter how much we feel we've let things slip. It doesn't matter when you come to the realisation that Jesus is standing right here and he's saying, come, let's do it again. Whether you want to call it a second conversion, whether you want to call it redemption, whatever you want to call it, different people call it different things. But when, when Cole Stringer preached this close to 40 years ago, it has never left me because there are times when we do ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are times when we do ignore something that Jesus has said, or there are times, you know, when you get that, just give everything in your purse to the Lord, you know, just, just pop it all in. And once I, I did it, I actually threw in the lay-by dockets and everything. I just emptied, I was in such a hurry to be obedient because I knew if I thought about it, I wouldn't do it. So I just grabbed everything in my purse and just chucked it in and then went, oh, no, lay-by dockets and everything. And they, got, they got the lot. You know, but, but God always gives us another chance and then another and then another. He's so gracious. But this is the part of the kingdom. Redemption is part of the kingdom story. It's part of the, it's part of the, it's part of the kingdom. Total redemption. So we're going to be looking at kingdom on Sundays because we need to understand kingdom culture, kingdom authority, kingdom power, kingdom identity, kingdom currency, kingdom constitutions, kingdom laws, all of these things. And then Wednesday nights will be this is how you live as an ecclesia. This is how you govern your life, govern your neighbourhood, govern your community, govern your town. Because you can't do it unless you understand kingdom. And you can't be part of the Ecclesia unless you, you know, you can't, we need both. So if you can't make Wednesday nights, we've got to, we'll have something available. But I'm just saying right now, there is an urgent call in the realm of the Spirit. Because our Father, the King of Glory, has sent his King's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring about his purpose and his plan for this nation, for your lives for your communities, for your families. But he is needing kingdom citizens.
who will then allow themselves to be conscripted into the kingdom army. You can stay a citizen and say, you know what, I don't want to be part of the I don't want to be part of the army. Leave that up to the Lord to work out with you. However, even if you decide not to become a part of the, the army, you're still going to be affected by the war. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd much rather flow with the Holy Spirit, get my orders from the Lord of hosts, and know that I'm under his protection, mm -hmm. but I just want to see God glorified yes. in my life, through my life, through this house, through your lives. Let God be glorified. Let the name of Jesus, yes. Yeshua Messiah, let that be the only name that is exalted through us and among us. And let the only power that we live by be the power of Holy Spirit. That you would take your rightful place in kingdom, in life, in Christ. Because God has an assignment for each and every one of you. doesn't matter where you are in life. He can fast track. He can re redirect. I said to Danielle yesterday, there was a little bookmark that says the narrow path. And I said, oh, can I have that bookmark? Because sometimes I feel like I straddle it. You know, like either side of the narrow path instead of walking right down the middle of it. But the Father is doing something new. And we can't look back. And we can't look around. We can only look to him. This has to be a kingdom reality. And last week we had two scribes, two angelic scribes walking around taking down names of those who are willing to align. They're here today. And even if you are unwilling but ready to be made willing, that's okay. But the scribes are here. Because we can no longer live like church members. And you're either a part of the kingdom moving forward at this point of time in this war or you are where you are. You sense the anointing? This is a, um, a time. And look, it's okay if you feel a bit fearful. I'm not quite sure what this means. I don't either. I'm not quite sure what this looks like. It's new to all of us. But I refuse fear to speak into my life. And I refuse fear to speak into yours. We are believers. We believe God. We believe his promises. And fear is expelled. The love of God expels fear. And we might be a little bit unsure, a little bit anxious. Take it to the cross. That's just the human, the, human, the soul, the flesh thing coming out. Learn to live by the Spirit. Take it to the cross. Move forward with Christ. Christ.